Uh, thank you. I greet you all in the lovely languages of uh, our land. I, I want to do a poem that says we are Africans. All of us that are here, we are Africans. As uh, Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe said, there is no race, there's a human race. And everybody who owes their allegiance you know, to Africa and commit themselves to Africa, it is. I am going to use the word I, but in that I, it is not me talking, it is you who's talking. Okay. I am an African caressed by African winds. Trade and anti-trade, washed by her many rivers, pure and impure. Endurance tested by the rugged ages of Mount Kilimanjaro and Ukashamba, within the retina of my eyes, in the mist of sandstorms, I carry a clear vision of Africa's rebirth, I swear, by every grain of sand in the Sahel and in the Halakhadi. I tasted the, I tasted the fragrance of dawn in Nyanga, Langa, Kukuletu, in Soweto and in Shaville, in my mother's womb, I was a neighbor to a bullet. Now I taste the fruits of dubious freedom in my land. Am I not the son of great African women, Asante Wa of Ghana, who make Lily of Kenya, who walk 200 miles in defense of British imperialism? I'm the son of the warrior queens of Africa, of Unzinga, Dongor, of Angola, Uman, Tantise, Wabatokwa. Yes, I'm the child of my mother. I've suckled the languages of my people in my mother's sweating breast with the fourth revolution has got to record and to keep and to bring back into existence. Right. I, I would therefore say that uh, if you want to know who I am, how many of you here speak speed? How many? Oh, there's one who speaks speed. Swazi? Yo, Swazi, I'm not getting educated. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> You speak sweet, I say to you. Kinas la kisama pila, kilaka homu, kilakam tipa, kinalisti bela sake kislamela kan tahoka pila, kisaba buchu chuchu, karika se pila kakopa na lim shima, karim shima ni tluhamu, tsileng, stibelia setla, arim pe mpe wala pisa, munuhona keza. Umu le soa tige, wena wek nene, nene na shula bombo mo chetela, basa o shambu ya shashabula. When I was here, I think when you came to the that's all I've been talking about. When I was here, King George Pesce, what's it? Oh, yes, oh, yes. But I'm going to get them back in the end of the day. I'm going to get them back in the end of the day. I'm going to get them back in the end of the day. For this one, I must sit down. Parte ima la kesa Afrikaner dekhte reke trekha komsa sa swartman. Ik zei, mijn hart verlang naar die stilte van die weeën wevende veld. Ver van die stad geleerde met die klank en die klank van geld. Mijn hart verlang naar die vrije reemte van mijn ziel en wat een verstaan. Ik zie nog de zon op die veld en die even gebloot daarboe. Mijn hart schiet vol van heemwe en mijn dromen zijn en mijn ooie. But again, we do not know that... Uh, People think rapping started in America, started in the, I think it's the Africaners who started rapping. <laughs> <laughs> I will do that, I do one poem in Mrs. Zulu, then I'll sit down. There's the blonde, there's the blow, there's the fell, there's the flesh and a flow, dry, pove and in some flesh, that's all. There's the balance come or the ocean, there's the graf and the grass, there's the fire and the trun, that's all. <laughs> Finally, uh, I come from Wazulu Natal, sometimes. <laughs> also, you're from Kikeza then? Yeah. Uh, who do you like? Dingane, Shaga, Shaga. All right. Uzungwa neganda, uzungwa nombele vele. Uzungwa mangulume ngwaza, wasa mangulume sibigelana. Usishaga, sishayegi sijenga manzi. Uno, tumeshe zika menzi. Ile mbele kama nyama lebe, go kalipo. Ushange, sabu kutu shaga. Ushaga, wanko sasa mashobe ni. Uto, 
Paganum Capi, Betta Gula Betta Zemlovini, Betta Sagai Busa Gabba and Cosi Gatilla Personetta Zella, Umdilo Tatelegam Chohane, Umdilo Hangu Hangu, oh, she just covers the Sergebe, was a wasps of a Bethany, what doubling the Manum Covis to the bit is a pegapes. Thank you, Professor. That was truly inspiring and encouraging. And just a moment to think that um, you speak so many different languages. And I know that this is a topic that is close to our Vice Chancellor's heart, Prof Professor um, Selitsi Malwala, who's going to be our next speaker. And he is an expert in um, the fourth industrial revolution and particularly in artificial intelligence. And I'm not going to give a long bio because he has much to say. And um, one of the things that he is looking into is how can we have computers that translate into varying different African languages? Because they're very good at translating into Chinese and German and English. Professor Malwala became our vice chancellor at the beginning of last year and has been the driving force behind this university embracing the fourth industrial revolution. And as has come out in this conference, the fourth industrial revolution isn't about something that is a fad, but it's about taking our country forward. And that has been very much Professor Mawala's vision. And we are very fortunate to have him as our VC. And with that, I'm going to hand over to you, Professor. Uh, yeah. wait, wait, mm. I would like to introduce him. Yes, please do. <laughs> A child of Timbanyika, the father of Vele Lambeu, you who begot to Uyando, you carry the blood of Chivase, the blood of Rabura, the jazz of uh, Mpofu and the Leguda, you who left your umbilical court in Zata, who walk along Lake Funduzi and Jelele Valley and sit under Songozi, you child of Bangona, you Nazi Tenze, the owner of Titenze, Nazi Tombo, the owner of the drumstick, Nda, Nda Yanduna. Uh, Professor uh, Pitikan Duli, I am actually quite impressed. <laughs> you know, I, I, I did not know that you know so much about uh, the culture of the place where I come from. So I come from the part of South Africa, the only part of South Africa that is north of the Tropic of Capricorn. 95% uh, 90, of South Africa is in the south of the Tropic uh, of, of Capricorn. So, so many people don't know much about that part of the world. Uh, it is uh, in that part of the world where you can be able to see Mozambique and Zimbabwe while you stand in South Africa. It's quite amazing, you know. So thank you very much for coming to the University of Johannesburg to talk about the fourth industrial revolution and the library. The traditional understanding of the library has been akin to a scene in the story, the beauty and the beast, when the beast uh, leads Bella to the library. The magically ornate library was the stuff of fairy tales. Cascading stairs, walls stacked with beautifully bound books, gold leaf accents, as Bella tells the beast, and I quote, your library makes our small corner of the world feel big. With the advent of the fourth industrial revolution, our traditional understanding of the concept is being subverted. Libraries are becoming less about brick and mortar and more about access to knowledge in a digital sphere. Already with a click of a button, we have access to millions of books without ever having to leave our homes. The classics, textbooks, biographies, fantastical fictions are freely available 
with an internet connection through sites such as Project Gutenberg, which holds 46,000 titles, the Internet Archive, which holds 7.8 million, or Google Books, which boasts 30 million books. Then, of course, there are 3.2 million titles of, uh, on Amazon's Kindle store and 2.5 million on Apple's iBook store. Knowledge is being democratized. While the Beast Library was somewhat of an architectural feat, it was not readily available, accessible by the townsfolk. It was just for him and Ballet. How many of you have read uh, Beauty and the Beast? How many have watched the movie? No wonder some of you are perplexed. <laughs> This is not quite my understanding of a library, particularly now as we see buildings transform into more than just beautiful shelves for books. The library is now a virtual space that can be consumed through Kindles, iPads, or smartphones. As Anthony Mandel of Cardiff University puts it, and I quote, the future of library is bigger than all the world's historical libraries combined, and smaller than a book on one of those libraries' shelves. Such a thing has only previously been see, conceived in fictions. For any tra traditionalist, it is difficult to resign yourself to reality, but then again, the nature of libraries has always been fluid. The origins of libraries were somewhat elitist. One of the oldest li public libraries in the United States opened in 1790 in Franklin, Massachusetts, where residents circulated books donated by Benjamin Franklin. Franklin started his own lending library in 1731 in Philadelphia called the Library Company, but it required a subscription fee of 40 shillings. Of course, at that time, uh, the Americans were not yet using the dollar, isn't it? At the time, literacy was restricted to a tiny elite and decidedly inaccessible to anyone else. This has since changed. Libraries are now sanctuaries, intended to be accessible to anyone. Now libraries do more than just house books. They are central to communities. They provide a space for knowledge, access to information to all, for all, and sometimes provide an escape from reality. I am reminded of Maya Angelou who credits the library for saving her, for saving her life after being abused as a child. As she skillfully told the story of how she discovered the library to an audience at the New York Public Library nine years ago, she said, and I quote, information helps you to see that you are not alone, that there is somebody in Mississippi and somebody in Tokyo who have wept. You have longed and lost, who have all been happy. So the library helps you to see not only that you are not alone, but that you are not really any different from anyone else." Close quote. But in the fourth industrial revolution, this also marks a time of disruption for libraries. The fourth industrial revolution is predicated on a confluence of the physical, digital, and biological technologies through technologies such as artificial intelligence, automation, uh, biotechnology, nanotechnology, blockchain, and communication technologies. I was trained as an engineer. The fourth industrial revolution has already completely transcended 
my profession because embracing technological changes is what we do naturally. For example, in the manufacturing industry, line operators can adjust the behavior and operation of robotic arms in real time on the user interface, which has increased their capability to support human operation and increase safety. This, of course, is a challenge in South Africa, as we still grapple with the three first three industrial revolutions. Last week, we were once again plunged into darkness after another bout of load shedding. On Tuesday, Business Day reported that an unreliable electricity supply has had production of Volkswagen despite backup generators. These power outages halted assembly line robots in their tracks, causing the robot to forget where it was in the assembly uh, uh, process and vehicle bodies already on the production line had to go back to the start. But we, we simply cannot afford these setbacks. Despite the naysayers, I would argue that keeping up with the fourth industrial revolution could have more of a, could have more of a detrimental impact. On Tuesday, Deputy President David Mawuza, I don't think I should say this, isn't it? <laughs> I'm going to uh, skip it. <laughs> On Tuesday, Deputy President uh, David Mawuza was placed in the hotspot in Parliament as members of Parliament demanded a better understanding of the fourth industrial revolution <laughs> and how South Africa will tackle the challenges associated with it. You all watched the response. <laughs> as EFF MP Buiseni Ndlozi put it, and I quote, there is very little understanding in the country and I think across the world about what we mean by the industrial revolutions. He then said, please, let's all take time to understand the fourth industrial revolution because it is upon us as a country, close quote. I am being quite generous. <laughs> <laughs> But I wouldn't fully discount Deputy President Mawuza's reply. He said, and I quote, I am not very sure as a country whether we are in the third industrial revolution or the second industrial revolution. <laughs> <laughs> and when you consider that metric students could not complete exams last week because of load shedding, or that countless shops in malls had to close their doors because their tills were offline, it is difficult not to buy into his argument too. But I argue that this serves as a clarion call to all South Africans to understand what exactly the phase we are entering into means. Regardless of how we grapple with aspects of the previous three revolutions, the advent of technological change is upon us and we need to adapt to it without discounting all the challenges. Perhaps the answer to our electricity supply problem lies in artificial intelligence forecasting electricity demand, generation, and predicting the weather and managing the fluctuations in the production of electricity. This has already been touted as a solution in countries that have moved away from coal energy in favor of renewable energy. As Jeremy Jagens, the chief technology officer at the World Economic Forum puts it, and I quote, the income inequality to climate change technology will play a critical role in finding solutions to many of the challenges our world faces. Imagine technologies demonstrate the rapid pace of human innovation and offer a glimpse into what a sustainable, inclusive future will look like." Close quote. Of course, all these things that I'm talking about require knowledge. The answer to the question that was posed 
to our deputy president required, required us to read. The suggestion that was given by a member of our parliament, Honorable Ndlozi, for us to be able to, to ingrain it in a proper sense require us to read. And it require libraries. So these are not the only challenges that we are facing as a country. We are facing the problem of unemployment. We are facing the prospect of even deeper job cuts as a result of the fourth industrial revolution. And it is not just unskilled workers who need to worry about being replaced, but workers in skilled professions are going to be impacted too. It then seems counterintuitive to embrace a process of automation. But I would argue the opposite. It is exactly what we need to tap into our growth potential, but it requires a fundamental relook at industries which will be most impacted. And this will require libraries to play a pivotal role. A 2017 McKinsey report projected that by 2030, at least a third of activities of 60% of occupations will be automated. But according to the Mail and Guardian, a new AITA group study commissioned by TransUnion last week showed that companies across the world are amassing vast volumes of data with intent of optimizing performance, identifying trends, and meeting rising consumer expectations. Very bombastic words. <laughs> Without a library, whether uh, uh, physical or digital, we cannot be able to uncover these bombastic words. Companies are looking to incorporate more artificial intelligence and machine learning technology into their analytical platforms to help them make sense of the information. One of the big issues, and Herbert Simon actually uh, foretold this, is when people become in, uninformed because the information is so large that they, they do not know which information is relevant and which information is not relevant. This is the era in which we live in. In the past, you were uninformed because you did not have enough information. Today, many of us are uninformed precisely because there's so much abundance of information that we are not able to even begin to scratch on what is important and what is not important. I am reminded of uh, uh, someone who told me that um, before, went to the Soviet Union, countries that did not want their, that wanted to control their citizens. The way to do that was basically to withhold information from citizens, to ban books. We know all about it here in South Africa. But today, what uh, propagandists uh, governments do is to give you information including fake information. And because of that, you become uninformed. It's just as effective. It's even more effective than withholding information because the person whom you are withholding information from does not know that you are trying to withhold information from them. So they are not going to go and ask Professor Pitika to organize a strike and demonstrate to his office because there's no censorship, it's just information overload. So these developments are very important and we have to take them seriously. In the medical industry, for example, which is tapping into biometric devices with scanning systems that fill the void between physician consultations, allowing for early treatment and prevention of chronic illnesses. This has made their jobs more effective, but has, has also, is also making uh, the job of a doctor a little bit irrelevant. It is not irrelevant. Doctors are still very important, 
because of this abundance of medical information, people are self-diagnosing themselves. They rush to the internet and find out what is the solution to the problem that they have. Of course, that is also dangerous. It's a danger of having too much information uh, that uh, you can actually try to go and self-diagnose yourself, which is something that should not be done. So the key to staying ahead of the curve, according to the World Economic Forum, is to map the scale of job change underway while identifying the emerging and declining job roles, identifying opportunities to use new technologies to augment human work and improve job quality, keep note of the progression of job relevant skills, and explore the potential for investment in retraining, upskilling, and workforce transformation. In summary, this means that in this era that we live in, for anybody to thrive, they will need to learn how to learn. They will need to learn how to unlearn. They will need to learn how to relearn again. Ultimately, however, many companies are afraid of adopting the fourth industrial revolution related technologies because of the perceived steep cost of new technology. This, I would argue, is far outweighed by the economic benefits that these technologies actually bring. As McKinsey uh, puts it, there is a potential to incrementally add 16% or around $13 trillion by 2030 to current global economic output if we adopt automation. When we break this down, automation of labor adds up to 11% or around $9 trillion to global GDP by 2030, while innovations in products and services could increase the GDP by about 7% or around $6 trillion. Consider, for in instance, that intro the introduction of steam engines during the 1800s boosted labor productivity by an estimated 0.3% a year. The impact from robots during the 1990s around 0.4%, and the spread of IT during the 2000s by 0.6%. This is not to say that there won't be job losses and that the potential for further inequality does not exist. Instead, it is a stark warning to all industries to adapt so that the potential for new jobs can emerge while we shift our understanding of current professions. As Philip Jennings, the General Secretary of Global Uni Union said, there is an opportunity to shape technology to improve people's lives through connectivity, education, health. We shouldn't be fearful and fatalist about it. Close quote. Again, according to the 2018 report of the World Economic Forum on the Future of Jobs, Nearly 50% of companies expect automation to lead to a reduction in their full-time workforce by 2022. The future of work is upon us, and we need to understand that. As a University of Johannesburg, our task is not only to understand the future of work, but to put skills that are necessary for our graduates to have those skills in order to thrive in the fourth industrial revolution. We already know what these skills are. These skills include multidisciplinarity, where people in human and social sciences must also take courses in technological subjects. And people in technological subjects must also take courses in human and social sciences. The era of the fourth industrial revolution, unlike the previous era, requires a generalist much more than it requires a specialist. When I started to program, uh, when I was uh, an undergraduate student in Ohio in the United States, you had to program everything by yourselves. Now you have graphical user interfaces where you program by dragging things and putting them together. 
it requires a different type of skill set, which is much more general than the skill set th that I required when I was programming in a, in a dead programming language called Pascal. <laughs> so roles are indeed changing and shifting with the average task hours performed by human beings predicted to be 58% and 42% performed by machines. These shifts don't necessarily equate to job losses. In your industry, the yellow pages and dictionaries have already become somewhat obsolete. I know Telcom still publishes the yellow pages, but how many of you still read the yellow pages? How many of you still form a company and make sure that it starts with four A's so that you can be in the front of a yellow page? Those were the strategies for survival. Of course, there are new ways in which you can be able to make sure that your company is favored by Google search. And we know what those things are. So new challenges are emerging. And some of them look like the challenges of the past. So these yellow pages now and dictionaries are completely digital. Libraries have moved towards information networking as smartphones replace much of the traditional roles. This is particularly poignant in the South African context. The figures are rattling. Statistics South Africa found that last year, more than three million South Africans are illiterate, meaning they do not have the ability to read and write in at least one language. More devastating than this is that the progress in international reading literacy study, which assesses children's reading comprehension, has placed South African children last in 50 countries. According to the study, 78% of grade four peoples in South Africa cannot read for basic meaning in any national language. In other words, eight out of 10 nine-year-olds in South Africa are functionally illiterate. And this is some of the issues that we will need to tackle as the library of the University of Johannesburg, certainly to understand what is going on. So we are in a crisis. Part of the solution is stepping into technology. While illiteracy is staggering, interestingly enough, smartphone penetration in South Africa in 2018 was nearly double that of 2016 at 81.7%, according to the Independent Communications Authority of South Africa. This is not just access to a mobile device, but one that has Wi-Fi connectivity, web browsing capabilities, a high resolution touch screen display, and the ability to use apps. Herein lies the potential to address the high illiteracy levels in the country. We need to use these technology devices that we have in order to bring more reading to our people. The idea of reading for our children is still as important in the fourth industrial revolution as it was in the previous in industrial revolution. So, Instead of fearing the fourth industrial revolution, let us exploit its advantages. As jobs change, as jobs are displaced, let us find ways in which we can use these technologies in order to create new forms of living, in order to create new forms of jobs. Hand in hand with high levels of illiteracy in South Africa climbing, um, unemployment rate currently sits at 29%. This figure is actually worse than you think. By the expanded definition, more than 38.5% or 10 million people in South Africa are un unemployed. I am reminded of an address on literacy by former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. Literacy is a bridge from misery to hope. It is not a tool for daily life in modern society. It is a bulwark against poverty and a building block for development, an essential complement to investment in roads, dams, clinics, and factories. 
Literacy is a platform for democratize, democratization and a vehicle for the promotion of cultural and national identity. Essentially for girls and women, it is an agent of family health and nutrition. For everyone, uh, for, for everyone everywhere, literacy is, along with education in general, a basic human right. Literacy is finally the road to human progress and the means through which every man, woman, and child can realize his or her full potential. Herein lies the potential for libraries to meet the requirements for the fourth industrial revolution, to stay relevant. While at first this may seem like libraries will become superfluous, it is quite the opposite. At the discussion put together by the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions some years ago, an agreement was landed on that, I quote, libraries enable literacy informed and participative societies. When we look at the future according to the debates in our teleconference, libraries will be trustworthy information brokers. We'll do more with new technology provide universal access to information and scholarly works, whether it be media or information we already know, or media preserving and providing access to information in all formats and providing trusted and effective support for political and social engagement. Libraries will be advocates for and facilitators of the fourth industrial revolution where people create their own devices, objects, and ideas." Close quote. Technological change only seems scary when you don't take history into account. Already libraries have adopted to technological change, certainly this library. In the 1800s, librarians had to write in librarian hand when curators of early collections believed that legible handwriting was a must for cut catalogs. This practice faded as typewriters grew in popularity. Similarly, similarly, automated systems in libraries, such as the online public access catalog, has seen web-based indices replace the printed, their printed predecessors. Libraries have digitized their collections and networked their catalogs. They have introduced e-books and readers to read them with. They have installed computer, computers for people who don't have access to the internet at home, provided free Wi-Fi and added extra plug points so that people can use their own devices. Here I am talking about the library of the University of Johannesburg. I think we should give a round of applause to Maria. But still, there is a lot of technology that could augment the library experience. For example, IV Guide, which is a concept device, can be attached to a pen and used for translating words found in the print book. This opens up access to learning, particularly in a country like South Africa, with 35 languages and 11 official languages. We have more than just 11 official languages. And languages spoken by significant numbers of uh, immigrants from Europe, elsewhere in Africa, and the Indian subcontinent. I'm including uh, that here. Chinese company Toot has a prototype of a device that looks like a bookmark, but can give directions to a book in the library, keeps track of borrowed books, and serves as a reminder of the return date. An NMZ, M NMC Horizon report summary, 2017 library edition, suggests that the shift in focus to digital resources will directly impact the role of library professionals who will be challenged to learn new skills to be able to implement the new technologies for learning, research, and information for their patrons. As much as the fourth industrial revolution librarians, as much as the fourth industrial revolution is here, librarians may need to extend their professional development. Many universities have started working together with industry by incorporating the required skills in the curriculum. 
There is also a massive influx of employers who are now partnering with universities to improve tailor-made learning programs for their employers to prepare them for the emerging job opportunities. And libraries are supposed to become much, much bigger part of this agreement. The Horizon report also identifies a shift in how students use libraries. It explains that students are relying less on libraries as the sole source for accessing information and more for finding a place to be productive. Students now expect to be able to learn and work elsewhere with continuous access to learning materials and one another for collaborative learning. As, library, as librarians, we need to assist students because fake news is not only about trying to get political favor. Fake news also appears in propagating theories that have not been proven. How do you know that information that you find in the library is actually reliable? We know what happened during the previous eras where we had peer review, not exactly foolproof, but it was good enough to be able to at least give you a level of quality of the information that you are getting from the source of information. When young students who are in their first years of study go into the internet to look for information, how do librarians play a role to make sure that they guide the students to know which information is reliable and which information is not reliable? And part of that is for us to reimagine the library as more than just a place for information, as a place where we interact with students and staff in order to disseminate and evaluate the reliability of information. Here at the University of Johannesburg, I have a reading club where I read a book and I invite staff and students to come to the library and discuss my, uh, and challenge my understanding of the book. And this year, here in this library, we read five books. AI Superpowers. <laughs> the first one was AI Superpowers. Uh, the second one was Thinking Fast and Slow. The third one was 21 Problems for the 21st Century. The fourth one was the fourth industrial revolution. And the fifth one was Eichmann in Jerusalem. And all this, I keep on meeting people who said, I did not know who Eichmann was. Oh, what uh, uh, thinking and fast and slow actually was all about. I did not even know the book actually existed. Of course, we have three types of readers. Okay, we have four types of readers. We have readers who don't read. <laughs> and then they come and they speak. You know. <laughs> then we have abbreviated readers. These are readers who go to uh, Wikipedia and read the abbreviated uh, uh, summary. Then we have uh, audio readers, the ones who play this thing uh, on, the, or, or, or on the radio and listen to it. Then we have real readers. Those are the ones who actually go and read the book in its original form. And that is the skill we should not lose because it is the best way in which you can be able to absorb information. It is the best way in which you can be able to see the connections between things. So reading is still very important. And again, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, Maria, for actually taking that idea forward very, very enthusiastically. So I leave you with the words of T.S. Eliot, who, don't po po who was a, a don't poet, essayist, publisher, playwright, literacy, social critic, and as a person who is from the field of artificial intelligence, T.S. Eliot was one of the founders of artificial intelligence. In data science, uh, when you study data science, you quote, you, one of the first things that you are taught about is what he wrote many, many years ago, when he said, 
we need to find information that is lost in the data. And we need to find knowledge that is lost in information. And we need to find wisdom that is lost in knowledge. I don't know, and you, do you know that uh, poem? Yeah, that is the basis of data science. So, but I'm not gonna quote that. What I want to quote is, and I quote, the very existence of libraries affords the best evidence that we may yet have hope for the future of man. Close quote. That was T.S. Eliot. And I have no doubt that this will continue to ring true as libraries evolve. Thank you very much, Nyabonga. Bye, thank you.